Welcome to part 7 of my series about Softube's modular. Today I'm going to talk about the module dub 4 a 147 voltage controlled LFO. But a short note first, please listen also to those some words at the end and don't just skip them. Thank you. This video will be the shortest in this series so far. Well, perhaps it will. And again, like with the ADSR in my last tutorial, I'll begin with the pure functionality, what's a quite fast thing to do. The A147 delivers four waveforms, triangle, sine, square and saw. All with more or less a kind of analog dirt in them, uh, what gives them their specific touch and makes them different from more clean and sterile digital oscillators. The LFO's frequency reaches from well below 0.02 Hz to about, uh, well, 33 Hz without an additional CV input. In other words, the LFO delivers periods from longer than a minute up to low frequency audible waves. Feeding control voltage in the CV jack and turning up the CV knob, we can reach up to about 180 Hz. I feed the node output of the MIDI 2 CV module in the CV jack of um, the LFO to demonstrate this. Reset. There is a reset jack on top of the unit next to the frequency knob. Feeding a signal, uh, signal in this jack forces the LFO to start a new cycle at once. I'll demonstrate it by feeding a gate signal in. I want to see the signal of the pure LFO and its reaction when I use the reset jack. Therefore, I use a VCO's square wave to reset the LFO. Triangle first, then sine, then square and saw at last. Please look at the graph to see what happens, for example, to a saw wave when reset um, by a higher frequency. The LFO's frequency gets that of a resetting saw wave. Additionally, the saw wave never reaches its maximum before a new reset impulse forces it to start anew. The output level is reduced, therefore. Well, okay. But what happens when the frequency of the resetting wave is higher than the maximum frequency of the LFO? Well, higher than 180 Hz. Let's find it out. And suddenly we get higher frequencies out of the LFO. The resulting frequency is, again, that of the resetting wave, no matter how, hi uh, sorry, how high this frequency is. But the wave form 
is that of the LFOs. In other words, I have transferred a square wave to a saw wave of the same frequency by using an LFO. I'll try the other waves of the LFO. Even the other waves of the LFOs react equally, but for the square wave. I will have to explain that, but I want to change the resetting waves at first. and we get the same result. All of the LFO's waves behave as we expected, but for the square. With the square we get silence, nothing, nada. All right, let's go and find out why. I start with a resetting square wave at about the same frequency as the LFO's square wave. Then I approach the point where the resulting wave from the LFO vanishes. I use a MIDI keyboard to increase the resetting VCO's frequency to make it a bit more interesting. The part of the wave's cycle which is positive gets longer but lower when the resetting frequency approaches the critical point and the negative part of the cycle gets shorter, gets more and more a peak, a needle, therefore. The energy of the whole wave decreases during the process as we can see in the spectrum. And here are the graphs which show what's going on with square waves. The resetting frequency is a little bit higher than that of the LFO's wave in the first graph. In the next graph, the resetting frequency is double as high as the LFO's. And now it is three times higher than the LFO's frequency. And at last four times and so on. 
the resulting wave equals more and more, uh, well, DC offset voltage without any oscillation. In other words, the different behavior of the square wave finds its explanation in the form of the wave itself, which doesn't give the resulting wave a chance to remarkably oscillate, let alone to reach the negative part of its cycle with high resetting frequencies. All right now, feedback. We will have to discuss two different kinds of feedback, feeding the LFO's output back to the CV input jack and feeding the LFO's output back into the, into the uh, reset jack. I'll start with feeding back in the reset jack. Our first idea may be, hey, nothing will change because the resetting frequency and phase is identical with the resetted frequency and phase. Trying it with the sine and triangle wave, we seem to be right. But proceeding with the square and the saw wave, things change dramatically. Well, as every good explorer starts with listening to the phenomena, I'll try different combinations of waves before I'm going to explain things. note some first results. There is no effect as long as we feed back triangle or sine waves in the reset jack. Feeding back the square wave, the frequency increases a little and the waveform, the spectrum, the sound changes. Feeding back the saw wave, the frequency increases dramatically and the waveform, the spectrum, the sound changes equally dramatically. The output level decreases to a nearly inaudible level if I feed back the saw wave, but patch the sine wave to the main audio input. Starting to think about these results, 
I first understand that there was a mistake in my thought that nothing would happen because of the same frequencies and the same phase. And this mistake reads, the reset process needs a certain level to act. Yes, phase and frequency of resetting and resetted wave are identical, of course, but the beginning of a cycle is not identical with the moment when the wave is resetted if the level of the wave at the beginning of its cycle is not sufficient to reset the wave. But, hmm, with square and saw, the level definitely is high enough to reset. Well, the fact that triangle and sine waves doesn't have any effect when fed into the reset, uh, reset jack makes me remember that reset needs an impulse, not necessarily a wave. Reset needs a distinctive, a prominent peak, a quite steep impulse flank. Neither sine nor triangle have such a steep flank, no reset, even if I used a second LFO. And now? As I'm thinking about the problem, I get aware of another assumption of mine which hasn't at all been proved yet. The presumption that the cycle of the waves starts at zero. If it didn't, the moment when the reset impulse reaches the input jack and the beginning of a cycle of square and saw waves might well be different. I'm going to find out now. I'm going to find out where the square wave and the saw wave start their cycles, at which phase angle to speak scientifically. First step. I let an LFO modulate the pitch of a VCO. I connect the VCO's output to the left audio out and the LFO's output to the right one. In the analyzers, the left output is the blue line and the right one is the green line. We see that the higher frequency of the VCO starts exactly at that moment when the square wave of the LFO has uh, its sharp upward flank. We can say it starts at the highest point of the LFO's wave. Now we know that the beginning of the higher frequency sine waves of the VCO shows us when the LFO's square wave has its maximum. I change now the patching. Therefore, I lead the second LFO's output to the right audio channel to the right audio channel and let this second LFO reset the first one. I adjust the frequency of the resetting LFO at a slightly higher rate than the frequency of the first LFO, which is still modulating the VCO's pitch. And we see that the VCO's higher frequency starts slightly after the lowest point of the resetting LFO's wave, which is, as we saw before, the highest point of the resetted first LFO's wave. As a result, we can say, the LFO's square wave starts its cycle at the maximum point of the wave when a reset impulse comes in. And now the same procedure with the LFO's saw wave. And we see again the jump to the higher frequency takes place at the peak of the, uh, of the saw wave at its maximum. I use a slightly different procedure now to make our investigation more interesting and do my first step. I reduce the frequency of the LFO and switch the signal analyzer to spectrum view. Second step, I let a second LFO reset the first one. 
and hey, look and listen, the VCO's frequency doesn't jump to its formerly highest level anymore. The meaning of this phenomenon can only be when the first LFO's saw wave is reset by the second LFO, the saw wave of the first LFO doesn't start at its peak, at its maximum, but somewhere halfway down from the peak to zero. The VCO's frequency depends on the level fed in the, VC, uh, fed in the VCO's uh, CV2 jack, the level of the saw wave of the first LFO. And we see and hear that this level is not the saw wave's maximum at the moment when the reset impulse from LFO2 comes in. The graph shows what's going on. Evidently, the saw wave doesn't start at its peak when reset. Let me show this phenomenon with the different frequency relations of the two LFOs. The second LFO, down, resets the first one, the upper one. to our main question. I don't have to explain the little changes in the square wave when fed back to, res uh, to the reset jack anymore, I think, but I definitely will have to explain the result of the above shown saw wave behavior. Here it is again. Let's look at the unmanipulated saw wave itself at first. Its cycle lasts 0.13 seconds, what makes a frequency of 7.69 Hz. And now feedback to the reset jack. The length of the cycle decreases to about 0.0032 seconds, what is a frequency of about 300 12.5 Hertz. Well, what happens to the saw wave when it is reset by itself? It resets when the upward flank arrives, because resetting needs a distinctive flank, an impulse. But the resetting forces it to immediately jump to that lower level which we saw before. And what causes this uh, little oscillation after jumping rapidly back down? Well, we are in the analog world. 
Imagine a metal spring to flip back. It will keep on oscillating for a while, and so do analog electronic circuits. Let me demonstrate just one more aspect. I want to find out how long a time goes by between the upwards flank of the saw and the incoming reset impulse. What is the moment when the saw wave's level has reached a sufficient level and forces itself to go down again? This time span is independent from the overall frequency of the LFO. The time measures of this impulse-like phase of the reset wave are, as shown in the graph, 0 0.0005 seconds between the start of the upward flank and the reset impulse, and about 0 0.00033 seconds between the arriving of the reset impulse and reaching the lower reset level. Well... I'll leave further experiments on that field to you. Perhaps I've got already too deep into details. Let me talk about the second above-mentioned way to feed back the LFO's output. Let me talk about feeding back to the CV jack. And again, phenomenology at first. I'll try all combinations of the four waveforms. With all Cobian combinations, others than the saw being fed back, the waves reduces to single plops with decreasing frequency when popping up the CV amount. When I feed back the saw wave, all waveforms increase their frequency with the amount of CV modulation rising. Let's go and find explanations. No. No explanations. Not now, not here. I'd rather invite you, I'd rather invite you to discuss this phenomena, this behavior of the LFO, on my forum Deep Sound Divers Coffee House. 
everybody, even a beginner, will be able to deliver at least an educated guess about the goings-on after the explanations and thoughts I have talked about in this video so far. So, I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. And don't be shy, tell us your opinion at www.rowfilm-medianet and go to the forum there. Uh, by the way, didn't I mention this was going to be the shortest video in this series so far? I will never say something like that at the beginning of a tutorial. I discussed some methods of combining a couple of ADSRs in my last tutorial. It's time to do the same with LFOs now. And, again, I'll limit the number of combined LFOs to two. Parallel at first. The easiest way to use parallel LFO waves is using only one LFO, but more than one of its outputs. For example, via the CV mix module, so please don't forget that the module's inputs add to each other and therefore we have to reduce the output of the CV mix module according to the number of used inputs if we want the same signal strength as with a single LFO wave. By tweaking the mixer's input, I can change the resulting wave, emphasizing a special waveform and attenuating another one. That's nice. But, unfortunately and, of course, all four waveforms have the same frequency as they are produced by one and the same LFO. I engage a second LFO, therefore. I can combine all four waveforms with different frequencies now. We must not forget that we use the LFO as a modulator most of the time and not as a sound source. Therefore, even the lower frequencies are important. Only here, to show the resulting waves, I use mainly the higher frequencies. Let me modulate a VCO's frequency by a combined LFO wave.
and additionally the cutoff frequency of a filter by the combined wave of two other LFOs. As the CV mix simply adds all inputs, it is quite easy to construct different modulating waves by graphically adding the individual single waves. But we are in the analog world, meaning you nearly never get the two or even more LFOs running at completely and 100% the same frequency or at 100% exactly the same phase and 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 if you wanted that. And the maximum and minimum levels of the different waveforms are not identical. Well, that's analog charm. Adjusting at least the levels of the CV mix brings us very near to the uh, theoretically constructed waveform. Only a short additional hint here. Instead of adjusting the levels of the CV mix module, uh, module, you could use an amplifier module to achieve the right levels. This amplifier module could be modulated by an ADSR or another LFO or or or. or. Well, two or more LFOs in serial now. We modulate the frequency of the second LFO by the first LFO. It's frequency modulation, therefore. But with frequencies below the audible range, we don't get those additional partials in the spectrum which made this typical sound of the 80s, or let so-called serious contemporary composers uh, to a whole new world of sound. We just change the second LFO's frequency according to the first one's frequency. an example for real modulation again and again I'm going to modulate a VCO's frequency.
I can't help adding a higher frequency from a VCO to the LFO, parallel at first. modulating the frequency of a second VCO with the resulting wave. And the same with the first VCO and the LFO in serial. And here is the underlying and modulating frequency of the LFO modulated by the VCO. Wow, thank you for watching. The next part of this series uh, about soft tubes modular is going to deal with the A118 noise module. There is a website of mine at www.rofil-medianet where you will find more information about this series of tutorials and about the modular. Mm, you can also download all drafts and graphics of this tutorial from there for free, of course. There is also a forum there, the Deep Sound Divers Coffee House, I think I mentioned it already in this uh, tutorial, where you can discuss my videos. Please consider liking, sharing and subscribing. And if you really like this video, please think about donating a little to help me making more videos like this one. Have a great day and a good time, Rolf.